Brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for the invitation. Um, this is, yeah, it's really exciting. I'm just going to bring up my whoops, slides. For a while now, I've been interested in the ancient practice of ecstasy, which is divination using the entrails. Um, it's um, so viscera from animals in the form of offal today um, is at least um, in the UK anyway, is perceived as waste product fall off from the butchering process. But in the ancient world, it was vibrant matter, vital to sacrificial rituals in the Babylonian, Assyrian, Greek and Etruscan cultures as a guide to decision making. In Mesopotamia, uh, the spleen, the lungs and the liver were, were observed, as well as the position, shape and convolutions of the intestines. At the moment of sacrifice, it was believed that the gods wrote their will on the innards, which was then interpreted. At the heart of ancient divination are notions of interconnectivity. The entrails metaphorically and physically connect the wider environment, actions, events, and celestial bodies with the inside of the bodies, the innards of animals, so much so that the fate of a whole human society could be read in the viscera of an animal. So despite the prevalence of hepa, hepatomancy, which is specifically liver divination, the evidence of actual representations of livers from antiquity is rare, um, as are images of liver divination itself and those of women performing the rite are even rarer. One such example of a woman, we think it's a woman, is the image that I've got on the right here. Um, is the is an example from the fifth century, um, and it's a life size marble relief sculpture from Arcadian Mantinea, known as the Stele of De Ottima, um, which is in the National Archaeological Museum of Greece in Athens. So they think it's a woman, even though she's got no head because they because they recognise the costume that she's wearing, um, and it depicts a woman holding a liver and is thought to be the only representation, visual or literary, of a female liver divine in existence. So it's a very exciting kind of object. And it inspired a series of participatory performances where I divine a lamb's liver using a system drawn and simplified from ancient Mesopotamian and Greek practices, employing the text translations of cuneiform and classical scholars. Without them, I wouldn't have been able to do this um, in relation to a question collectively asked by the audience. So it was first enacted um, amongst chefs, uh, food writers and scholars at the Oxford Symposium on Food and Cookery. And I think we have someone here today, Elizabeth, who um, was actually at that um, first enaction. Um, and it was also um, uh, has been performed at some performance festivals and in smaller domestic settings um, and uh, quite a few of those. Um, some more, uh, examples of representations of livers include the 32 uh, models of livers from the Palace of Mari, which is modern day Syria, in the Louvre um, in Paris, dated from between 1800 BC and 1700 BC. Um, these little um, exquisite forms would fit in the palm of your hand. Each represents what is thought to have been an actual liver with its specific malformations, accompanied by a cuneiform inscription detailing the associated prediction. Um, in, the, in, the, in the British Museum, there's a liver tablet uh, from Sippa in, in southern Mesopotamia from between 1900 and uh, 1600 BC, which has a surface of a grid of 55 sections you can see with little holes. And it, this is thought to be a teaching tool, um, which is unlike any other specimen where you would have um, you had a, an actual liver um, and you would use your kind of a little peg or something to mark the area on the liver on this teaching tool where there might have been a malformation. Um, there's also a, uh, an Etruscan diagram um, known as the Piacenza liver. This one is a bronze um, from the late second century BC found at Diesima um, di Gossolengo in northern Italy. Um, informed by these liver models are my own series of prints, um, which um, 
Lowry and um, I think Gail might have mentioned, but maybe not, um, the liver models that are on display at um, at the kind of uh, the Royal College of, College of Physicians in the um, current show and can now be seen on the uh, online exhibition. So there's a pair of them on there, and, but there are um, 12 in the series and they're made from direct impressions of of um, lamb's liver using the jayotaku uh, or Japanese technique for fish printing, which is a form of nature printing where you apply um, the, well, well, I applied the ink to the liver surface and dabbed it off and then I pay, laid some paper um, and gently rubbed it. So the, so the, uh, the liver was um, the plate, which then is, the paper's then lifted to reveal the imprint. Um, So um, as well as the liver, the colon, or as translated as the palace of intestines by the 20th century Assyriologist Ernst Weidner, um, were also examined. Convoluted forms found on clay tablets from ancient Mesopotamia are thought to be the results of sacrifice and divination. When laid out for inspection, intestines form a distinctive labyrinthine spiral which for the Romans and the Etruscans was associated with the orbital motions of planets. My engagement with this um, aspect of extispacy um, encompasses performances and baked goods, such as extispacy biscuits, um, the sculptural pies with coiled sausages inside of our palace of intestines, which I'll talk about, um, who wa wa in the everyday and almanac, which is an artist book, which I'll also um, talk about a bit, and extispacy in the everyday, the ongoing noticing and collection of images of actual guts and matter which resemble the intestines, which um, we'll use as a basis as well um, for some activities. So our palace of intestines has been performed in, performed in a few scenarios. Most recently and significant was the university at the University of Surrey in Guildford in 2018. The performance, um, our palace of intestines for stag or stage hill, um, centered around a large pie, uh, symbolic of the sacrificial body, which was entombed in an earth oven grave. The performance involved exhuming and disinterring it from its tomb oven, or it could also be said, birthing it from its earth womb oven. The stoneware mould, which shaped its form, was shed to reveal six extispacy models cast into the pastry walls. The pie was then processed and its examination ritual performed. The pie was cut open to reveal the labyrinthine sausage within. Twelve convolutions were counted. Um, this was a good omen. Um, and before further examination occurred, when we, the audience participants and I ate the pie together, kind of tearing off the pastry and cutting into the sausage. Is everyone seeing a video um, of a kind of flicking of images there? Hopefully you can. Um, so this is um, extispacy in the everyday, um, which I've been collecting over a number of years from urban environments, rural landscapes and during my everyday activities, um, gathering these images depicting actual guts and materials which resemble the intestines. Such a way of engaging with the world awakens attitudes and skills, as historian R. John R. Stilgo writes, made dormant by programmed education, jobs, and the hectic dash we experience in our lives from the dry cleaners to the grocery store to the dentist. By honing my capacities to notice entrails in the world, in a dropped shoelace, a discarded cabling, or a dead snake, or a garden hose, I'm enacting what philosopher Jane Bennett calls thing power, enabling the curious ability of inanimate things to animate, to act, to produce effects dramatic and subtle. In noticing and collecting animal and non-living materials in the forms of guts, I'm reinterp reinterpreting the practice of extispacy, divination using the entrails, as an invocation cultivating patient sensory attentiveness to non-human forces operating outside and inside the body. 
To divine also means to conjure, which thus signifies ideas of bringing into existence. And so I call to mind my insides, conceptually and visually reconnecting the idea of the gastrointestinal tract, though seemingly inside the body, is actually part of the outside world, problematizing false dichotomies, the boundaries of inside and outside. Feminist philosopher Shannon Sullivan reminds us that the gut is the site of a transactional mingling of organism and environment. So early on in this collecting, I assembled some of these images in a photo book in the form of a medieval medical folding almanac, which I call um, called Huawa in the Everyday. Folding almanacs were worn by the belt from the belt and contained astrological, medical, and calendric information, and were employed by physicians to prognosticate and diagnose. The book contains 12 images of entrails and coiled matter encountered in my art materials research and the everyday that might resemble the demon Huwawa or Humbaba's face. <clears throat> images include a plate of spaghetti, a bundle of blue and white film and audio leader tape, a yellow garden hose, a pile of black electricity cables and a film still of character crap light in Peter Greenaway's belly, film Belly of an Architect where he holds a uh, red tubing to his abdomen. The title is based on the Mesopotamian divination model housed in the British Museum, which uh, portrays Huawa's face as coiled intestines. Huawa described as a monster, but who was actually the protector of the cedar forest in the Epic of Gilgamesh was killed by Gugamesh and his friend Enkidu in what is arguably the first example of environmental desecration by humans. The inscription on the reverse of the tablet reveals an omen that if entrails are encountered that look like this model, it would mean revolution. Whilst not directly illustrating medical or astrological information, my interpretation draws on the connection between astrology, divination using the stars and planets, and the practice of ecstasy, divination using the entrails. It's thought that both forms of deductive divination in what one pra practices and one observes natural phenomena were the, the two most important and widespread forms of divinationary practice in ancient times. Each drew on the other, operating, as philosopher and art historian George Diddy Huberman argues, like a side real anthropomorphic correspondence. That is the transferring of the cosmic system onto man. He writes, the folds of the animal body offered the possibility to read what was never written in the map of the sky and in the body of the gods. My book can be carried on the person attached to a belt with a almanac's threads and used as a prompt during daily activities to see acutely, to notice and to make connections. In making the audience member a participant, you're encouraged to perceive entrails in the world and at the same time to sense your insides within, foregrounding the idea that the elementary canal is both inside the body and also a tube that runs through it, part of the external environment. Bound up in the observing and documenting of materials that resemble guts is the faint hope that we may see Huawa or other labyrinthine forms reflected by the gods or by chance. But this is perhaps less a search for the actual form, but rather another kind of reflection, a sharpening of one's sensitivity to such materials and forms enables us to rethink our relationship with the world, to dissolve these hierarchies of self and other and boundaries of inside and outside. As philosopher Elizabeth Gross writes, the body provides a point of mediation between what is perceived in, as purely internal and accessible only to the subject and what is external and publicly observable, a point from which to rethink the opposition between the inside and the outside, the private and the public, the self and the other, and all the other binary pairs associated with the mind-body opposition. Such practices cultivate an awareness that builds into mindfulness, into the enduring pleasures of noticing and thinking about what one notices. 
enabling us to diagnose as in the original sense of the meaning of the word from Gnostic, meaning to learn or to come to know the world and our place within it. <clears throat> Finally, returning to the forms found on clay tablets. Being representations of the colons of sheep, it's believed that they're at least part of the inspiration for the spiraling maze patterns in a variety of different cultures in antiquity. This connection is illustrated by the character Oshima in Haruki Murakami's novel Kafka on the Shore, when he enlightens Kafka on the origins of labyrinths. It was the ancient Mesopotamians. They pulled out animal intestines and used the shape to predict the future. So the prototype for a labyrinth is in a word guts which means that the principle for the labyrinth is inside you. And that corresponds to the labyrinth outside. Things that are outside you are a projection of what's inside you. And what's inside you is a projection of what's outside. 